Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod. I am Chris, and if you are here today to listen to a dreamy story that will soothe you and comfort you, you are in the right place. Tonight, we'll be retelling a famous story you might have heard before, called Pride and Prejudice. Before we begin this story, let's settle down, close our eyes, and cast your mind back to the feelings of your first love. Innocent, hopeful, young. Breathe in, allowing your body to accept that innocence, hopefulness, and youthful feeling. Breathe out allowing your mind to relax, your chest, stomach, and legs to grow heavy as you sink into your bed and settle down to rest. And now, if you are ready and breathing easily, I'll begin the story. Mr. and Mrs. Bennet had five beautiful daughters but each was quite different from the other. It can be said that they were all complete individuals. And it can also be said that Mrs. Bennet did not quite see it this way. The pair had been married for 23 years and lived on a large estate. But while Mr. Bennet occupied his mind and time with reading and studying, Mrs. Bennet had only one goal, to get all her daughters married. Indeed, this seemed to be, of late, her sole purpose in life. And even though she was a woman who was not very wise in the ways of intellect or culture, that didn't matter. The only thing that occupied her mind was the complex problem of arranging each of her daughter's marriages. So preoccupied was she with this matter that Mr. Bennet had given up trying to persuade his dear wife that there were other, more important things in life. Thus, he took a nonchalant view and let Mrs. Bennet go about fussing as she did on a daily basis with each of her daughters. If there were invitations to balls, she made sure they all went. If there were rich gentlemen calling upon their estate, she would set out her best tea sets and serve them in a most accommodating manner. One day, it reached Mrs. Bennet's ears that a certain young and very wealthy man by the name of Mr. Bingley was arriving in town and would be seeking out a wife. Mr. Bingley was very good-looking, and had all the manners that a proper gentleman should. He always had a pleasant countenance, and his sisters also carried an air of grace, finesse, and respect. When Mr. and Mrs. Bennet were invited to Mr. Bingley's ball with their daughters, there was nothing else that would take their attention. Mrs. Bennet fussed over what clothes her darling daughters would wear, and saw to it that each had fine hairpins and blush and polished shoes for the ball. It was to be a splendid event. All the guests were driven to the ball in carriages, and upon alighting at the grand estate, all of the Bennet daughters were in awe. Now, Mr. Bingley had a friend, a certain Mr. Darcy. He was tall and handsome, with dark hair and deep-set eyes. As they entered, all eyes were on Mr. Darcy, for rumour had it that he came with not just handsome features, but a fine inheritance, ten thousand a year to be exact. The ladies all swooned and hoped to dance with Mr. Darcy. He seemed even more handsome than Mr. Bingley, and was greatly admired the whole evening. 
Soon, however, his true colors showed themselves. Mr. Darcy was arrogant, did not care for small talk, and appeared proud and aloof. He kept his distance from the guests at the party. Many assumed his grand estate and countless riches attributed to his disagreeable manners. They were quite opposites, the two friends. While Mr. Bingley got to know everyone in the room, smiled and held lively conversations, Mr. Darcy seemed to ignore most of the guests and acquaintances. Such a contrast they were. Mr. Bingley was so delighted with all the beautiful ladies in their colorful and sparkling gowns that he enjoyed every dance and spoke about holding another ball for everyone's entertainment quite soon. At one point, Mr. Bingley pressed his friend Mr. Darcy to dance. Oh, come now, Darcy, he said. You must not stand stupidly alone. Have the next dance. I hate to see you standing so lonely by yourself at such a lively party. I don't think so, said Mr. Darcy. There isn't any woman in the room whom it would not be a punishment for me to dance with. What? cried Bingley, who had enjoyed every dance with all the young girls present who had obliged him. I'd never met with so many pleasant girls in my life as I have this evening. So many here are uncommonly pretty and quite unique, you must admit. Mr. Darcy, looking at the eldest Miss Bennet, who was dancing with his friend, remarked out loud that Mr. Bingley was dancing with the only handsome girl in the room. Well, his friend did not dispute this for a minute, saying, Well, yes, to be sure. She is the most beautiful creature I have ever seen. And she has four sisters. The one sitting just behind you is very pretty. Why don't we ask her sister to introduce you? Mr. Darcy, turning round with embarrassment at being caught off guard, saw Elizabeth Bennet behind him. A younger of the sisters, with great wide eyes and an intelligent face. Yes, perhaps, but not quite so pretty as his friend suggested. He said coldly to Mr. Bingley, All right, she is tolerable but not pretty enough to tempt me. Go back and dance so gracefully as you have been, dear friend, and don't waste your time trying to tempt me. Mr. Bingley could see that his friend was not in the mood for matchmaking. He looked at him with pity as Mr. Darcy walked off, and Elizabeth thought that this conversation she overheard was, indeed, quite ridiculous. That evening, Mrs. Bennet felt very pleased. Her daughters had danced and were admired, especially the eldest Jane. And not just once, but Mr. Bingley had danced with her twice. Jane was satisfied, her mother was satisfied, and it seemed that Mr. Bingley would be calling at their home to make a proposal very soon. Elizabeth had kept to herself much of the evening. But this was her usual way. Catherine and Lydia had both danced with so many young men they couldn't keep count. Mary had made plenty of conversation with some of the elderly women. All in all, it was a successful party. When they returned home late that night, they found the head of the household, Mr. Bennet, still up, his nose buried in an intellectual book. For, with a book, he kept no track of time and never worried about the female members of his household. He was content to read at home and know that his daughters were enjoying the dance. Plus, there was the issue of his wife, and if she was content with her evening, then he was a happy husband too. He only looked up when his wife called quite excitedly. Oh, my dear Mr. Bennet, 
she was so happy. We have had a wonderful evening, a most excellent ball. You should have been there, for I'm sure you would have enjoyed the sight of your daughters dancing with such handsome partners. Jane was so admired by everyone, and not least by Mr. Bingley. Imagine, he even danced with her twice in a row. Mr. Bennet looked up from the pages of his book a little, as his wife continued prattling on. Oh, I am so delighted with Mr. Bingley, continued Mrs. Bennet, and I haven't even begun to tell you how charming his sister was and how elegant and lovely and modern the dresses that they danced in were. The lace was exquisite. Well, here Mr. Bennet decided to interrupt her, for he did not care much for descriptions of finery. His wife saw the glint in his eyes and decided to change the subject matter, instead to the rudeness of Mr. Darcy. Oh, what a disagreeable, horrid man that Mr. Darcy, she said, and he thinks of himself so highly, well, he must, walking in the way that he does. I did hope Lizzie would take a liking to him, but now I have changed my mind, and it is probably for the better. He is not even that handsome, I should say, not like Mr. Bingley in the least. After her mutterings, the elderly pair retired to bed. When Jane and Elizabeth were alone that night, Jane confided in her sister how very much she admired Mr. Bingley. He is so good-humoured, lively, sensible with exquisite manners she said. He is simply perfect for me. Yes, and he is also handsome, replied Elizabeth, agreeing with her sister's observations. It was such a compliment that he asked me to dance a second time, don't you think? asked Jane. Elizabeth was her sister's best friend, and agreed with all of her musings. The two enjoyed each other's company, and Elizabeth thought to herself that she only wanted the best for Jane. That is how she loved her. Now, Mr. Bingley was quite a wealthy man. He had inherited from his father an entire estate and manor. He and Mr. Darcy had a very steady friendship, but they were quite opposite in character. Mr. Darcy could sometimes seem haughty, but the truth was that he was reserved and didn't really care about what other people thought of him. His friend, on the other hand, put a great deal of value on others' opinions. Well, Mr. Bingley and Jane soon became quite close. Indeed, it seemed that they were meant for each other. Meanwhile, Mr. Darcy began to grow more and more fond of Elizabeth. He didn't quite agree with her whole family, however, especially the chatty mother who seemed over-eager to marry all of her daughters off. Mr. Darcy didn't quite know what it was about Elizabeth that attracted him the most. Her spirited wit was one of them. Her beautiful, dark, and expressive eyes were another reason he found himself thinking about her all the time. However, to his dismay, Elizabeth showed no reciprocal interest in him. Instead, she voiced her attraction to George Wickham, a soldier and former officer. Handsome Wickham, with his dark blonde hair and flirtatious boyish ways. Mr. Darcy knew many a girl who had fallen for Wickham's charms. One day, Elizabeth found herself alone with Wickham, and asked the young man what he thought about his friend, Mr. Darcy. Mr. Wickham shrugged and did not look too interested in pursuing the topic. So, Elizabeth pressed him, reluctantly. It seemed Mr. Wickham admitted to Elizabeth that he was not very close to Mr. Darcy, because of a past issue that he cared not to bring up right away. Well, this curious answer intrigued Elizabeth all the more. 
finally, Wickham tells Elizabeth the truth. He and Mr. Darcy have known each other since boyhood. Darcy's father even favoured Wickham and took him under his wing. According to Mr. Wickham, Mr. Darcy swindled him out of a fortune, and because of this, the two grew apart as they grew older. Elizabeth, hearing all of this, decided that now she liked Mr. Darcy even less. How could he be so cruel to poor Mr. Wickham? She thought to herself. While Jane and Elizabeth developed deeper relationships with each of their close friends, a certain William Collins, a clergyman, visits the Bennet family. His patroness, Lady Catherine de Boer, informs the Bennet family that she highly approves of his marrying one of the Bennet daughters. After all, according to legal papers, it is Colin who will inherit the family estate after the parents are deceased, and he will need a decent wife to run the household and do the Lord's work. Mr. Collins, after visiting the family, takes a special liking to Elizabeth. He asks her hand in marriage. Mother Bennet is delighted, but everyone's excitement turns to disappointment when Elizabeth refuses Mr. Collins flat out. Mr. Collins is angry. Of course, try as he may, he cannot force Elizabeth to love him. And so the unhandsome clergyman settles for Elizabeth's friend, Charlotte Lucas. She, Charlotte, is content to marry for security rather than love. And in no time at all, it seems the two are engaged and wed. When Elizabeth visits Charlotte at her new estate in Hunsford, Kent, she meets Mr. Collins' patroness, who also happens to be Darcy's aunt. She is the Lady Catherine de Boer, an overbearing woman. Lady Catherine seems to enjoy, or thrive rather, on meddling with other people's relationships, lives, and their very futures. It's no secret what she thinks about each lady and her suitor. Lady Catherine carries this arrogant air wherever she goes. Despite what his aunt thinks, Darcy musters up the courage one day to propose to Elizabeth. Calmly, he confesses that he has taken an interest in her, but not just an interest. His passions have grown over the several meetings they have had, and it doesn't really matter what his rich aunt thinks. Mr. Darcy would like to ask Elizabeth to be his wife. Elizabeth is shocked at first, or she is prejudiced against him believing Wickham's story to be true. She is convinced that he is the one to blame for poor Wickham's misfortune, and so, in her pride, Elizabeth refuses him. Mr. Darcy is hurt, of course, but understands how her feelings could have easily been swayed. To explain the facts better to her, he decides to instead write a letter to Elizabeth. In this letter, he details the facts from his side of the story. According to Mr. Darcy, he is innocent of wrongdoing, and in fact, it was Wickham who mishandled his father's finances, swindling whatever gifts were given to him in kind. A month later, Elizabeth takes a trip with her aunt and uncle Gardner to Derbyshire County. Unbeknownst to Elizabeth, this grand estate belongs to Mr. Darcy. Quietly, Elizabeth tours the grand villa, visiting the rooms one by one, amazed at their intricate and exquisite beauty. After half a day of exploring, Elizabeth is lost in a world of awe, and, 
just when she thinks she is alone in her mind's thoughts, Mr. Darcy enters the room. Surprised to see him, she spins around embarrassed, but Mr. Darcy reassures Elizabeth and treats her kindly. He allows her to tour the rest of his beautiful estate and stands back at a distance, content to see her happy and enjoying this grand environment. As a final gesture of grace, Mr. Darcy invites Elizabeth to dinner. Truth be told, he is still in love with Elizabeth, and if Elizabeth were true to herself, she would now realize the feelings she is beginning to have for him. While away, Elizabeth receives two alarming letters. One is from her sister Jane, who informs her that her other younger sister, Lydia, has suddenly eloped, and with Wickham of all people. Now, you must understand that in those days, and in those type of arrangements, for a young woman to run away with her lover was considered a disgrace. Elizabeth and her whole family are distressed. The dishonor this event would bring on their family is so great, it might ruin the future of each of the girls. However, they don't have to worry about a thing. Upon their return, Elizabeth finds out that Wickham has, in fact, gone the proper route and planned a wedding for him and Lydia. They will be a respected couple, after all. What Elizabeth does not know is that it is Mr. Darcy who has saved the reputation of her family. After finding out that Wickham had eloped with one of the Bennet girls, he orchestrated the marriage and paid for the wedding party and fees so that the other Bennet daughters would not suffer from a mired reputation. Pride and Prejudice is the most popular of the famous writer Jane Austen's novels, and it was also one of the first she ever published. It was titled First Impressions in the original version. Not many readers know that this story was completed in 1797, but was rejected for publishing. This is a fact many forget when they remember how popular the novel eventually became. In 1812, Jane Austen rewrote it and published it the next year with a different title, Pride and Prejudice. The second version, critics say, seemed more mature and sold quite well. Austen's characterizations and portrayal of everyday life were highly praised by literary critics. Her telling and retelling of a love story showed the everyday feelings of people who felt trapped in different fringes of society. The strength of Pride and Prejudice is in the detailing of its characters, who display various elements of humanness, from weakness to strengths, from hopelessness to hope. Jane Austen is a masterful storyteller. In Pride and Prejudice, she skillfully plays with irony, dialogue, and realism. And as you learn about each character as they develop, and the love between their personas grow, you start to become enchanted just reading the novel. Some wonder about the title. And with it, Jane Austen wished to present the other side of hypocrisy in a world dominated by the rules and regulations of class societies. Of course, at the end of the story, we find the main character, Elizabeth, simply smitten, hopelessly in love with Mr. Darcy. She cannot resist his charms any longer, and in fact, finds that she has no desire to. Her feelings change from chasing the young, handsome, and seemingly reckless George Wickham, who ends up marrying her sister, 
and while she may be disillusioned with the thought of marriage, the young Elizabeth is romantic at heart. No, she will not marry simply for money, or a state, or a good fortune, or promised security. This is her mother's wish, not hers. Yet, in the end, it is the wealthiest of all the male characters we read about in Pride and Prejudice, whom she falls hopelessly in love with. Then, Elizabeth must swallow her pride and admit her feelings for Mr. Darcy. She must admit that her initial spite for him was caused by ignorance, and when she finds out that her family's fortune and reputation has been saved because of his goodwill and character, she sees a deeper man. Yes, it is quite ironic. At one point, her sister Jane asks her when it was she began to love Mr. Darcy. Well, it has been coming on so gradually that I hardly know when it began, admits Elizabeth. But I believe I must date it from my first seeing his beautiful grounds at Pemberley. The truth, however is that Elizabeth does not really know when Cupid's bow first settled. It could have been that day in his villa, or it could have been much earlier. For isn't it true that real love takes time to have its way? Any fairy tale can enchant two characters and make it seem as if a magic spell touches their hearts in mere seconds. In this story, we learn that love has many dimensions and cannot be evaluated as easily as Mrs. Bennet judges the men she wishes her daughters to marry. It is the dialogue between the author's characters that is most vivid, even when they seem to talk to themselves. Their conversations reveal their characters with each line, each sentence, each admittance. Elizabeth's talk is direct, Mr. Bennet's a lot more sarcastic, Lydia's more silly and loud, while Mr. Collins is tedious and hard to admire. Whenever you have the chance to get your hands on this delightful novel, you must soak it up as an experience in human character. Note how the human minds change, how love causes uncontrollable feelings and actions, how each scene is simply a sketch of a greater picture that Jane Austen wanted to present to the world. There is a magical, timeless quality about Pride and Prejudice. Yes, and if you were to read it today, it could almost be the dialogue of teens in love in the 21st century. This is what makes stories like hers last forever when an author can craft such scenes with wit, charm, and grace. By the end, we find that Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth do indeed soothe each other's hearts and heal each other's wounds with a shared love and union. I hope you enjoyed this retelling of Pride and Prejudice. And I hope that as you close your eyes and drift off to dreamland, you too will find a contented feeling of love and feel safe in the knowledge that at the right time and the right place, all those wonderful feelings will find their way to your heart too. Thank you for joining me on Soothing Pod. Good night and sweet dreams. <laughs>